So we are five episodes into this podcast series, The Days of David, and we haven't met our star yet. But like every great epic, we have to know the environment they're born into to understand what made these guys so heroic. So in this episode, episode five of our Days of David podcast series, epic podcast series, today we're going to meet the hero. We're going to meet David. We have to go back to his origins to get a little bit of a feel for who this guy is, who or really who this boy is when we first meet him. When it comes to his origin story, we already touched a little bit on his Moabite grandmother, Ruth. Like I said in that episode, with the story of David, we got to be prepared for a lot of the rules to be broken. That's part of the point here. We'll, we'll talk about that before we're done with this series. That really is part of what makes David, his life, both a tragic drama and also an inspiring story. He broke all the rules. Our story today picks up, for those of you who are following along in your Bibles, I know I've, I've heard from several listeners out there who are actually doing a study, a character study on David while they listen to this podcast series. So today we pick up at 1 Samuel 16, chapter 16. So Samuel and Saul have departed. And for the rest of Samuel's life, these two guys won't be reunited. They won't even see each other face to face again in Samuel's lifetime. And that apparently hit Samuel pretty hard, as opposed uh, as he was to the idea of a king in Israel on a strictly spiritual instinctual level, he had grown fond of Saul, Samuel had. The two of them had birthed something new into the earth in the form of this monarchy, and they did it in partnership with God. So Samuel had high hopes for the king. And when he pronounced judgment on Saul over the disobedience regarding the Amalekites and King Agag that we talked about in the last episode, it wasn't an issue of anger or vengeance on the part of Samuel. Samuel was doing the same thing before this king that he had done before his mentor, Eli. He was holding true to the standard of God. He wouldn't relent on it. He wouldn't compromise. And that's what made Samuel who he was. That's what what made him such a formidable man, such a formidable prophet. So impressive to look at when we read scripture. But in the aftermath, after this uh, confrontation with Saul, Samuel mourned. It saddened him to lose Saul as a friend and what he may have hoped to be a protege. It made Samuel sad. So we don't know how long a period passed, but eventually God himself called an end to Samuel's mourning. Verses 1 to 3 in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you, Jesse the Bethlehemite. The first mention of this man since we left his great grandmother in the book of Ruth. And it's important to note Samuel's response too. the severing of his relationship with Saul. It wasn't it was not amicable. All right. His life was in danger. Saul wasn't the man he was called to be, was not the man he once was. He's dangerous now. And we'll see just how dangerous he is as the story goes along, but dangerous enough that Samuel expressed legitimate concern for his life. Saul had moved from being the Lord's anointed to a dark force in the land of Israel. He can can fight still, but he's not the leader of the people he was called to be. You'll notice in that passage, God didn't counter Samuel's assertion that his life was in danger. Instead, God gave him a tactic for disguising what his true intentions were as he goes to meet Jesse in Bethlehem. So under the guise of a sacrifice, Samuel heads to Bethlehem. He calls Jesse and his sons to join him. And when the sons arrive, Samuel sets his eyes on the oldest son, Eliab. Now, now surely, as Samuel looks at him, surely this is the one God wants as king. Well, God corrects him pretty quick here. But there's good reason for Samuel to have thought this. The last time, in fact, the only other time that Samuel had appointed a king, it was Saul. And Saul was head and shoulders above everyone. The word of God documented for all eternity how impressive Saul was just in sight and appearance among his neighbors. So why wouldn't the next king be just the same? And that's what Samuel saw in Eliab, but he wasn't the one. And that's when God gives this unique counsel to Samuel. That forever sets David apart from what came before and from what would come after. 
This counsel also gives us insight into the mind, the, the heart of God, and explains some of the paradoxes of David's life that we'll come to in this story. This is verse 7. But the Lord Sam, said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, every once in a while, we come to a verse or passage of, of Scripture that should flood our minds with understanding, with insight when it comes to the nature of God. And this is one of those moments, all right? God doesn't see the way a man sees. He doesn't pay attention to the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. Now you may think, yeah, yeah, I got that. I know that. No big deal. But do you? And isn't it a big deal? Think about how much time we give to the outward appearance of our lives. Think about how much influence the outward appearance of other people's lives has upon us. That's the way man sees, not the way God sees. I think about churches I grew up in and how frequently there was a violation of that very ethic. It was subtle, but our culture was, it looked, it was influenced by the outward appearance of things rather, rather than the heart of the matter. We can't claim to represent the voice and purposes of God if we can't even find his perspective on things. He looks to the heart, not to the outer appearances. God looks to the heart, and for the rest of this story, when we look at the highs and lows of David, we got to look at the heart if we want to really understand what's going on. David committed sins and mistakes far worse than Saul actually did, at least what's recorded in the Bible. That's the great paradox. Even though David did all of these things, God favored David. When Samuel rebuked, rebuked Saul and, and pronounced God's judgment on the king, he said, The kingdom has been taken from you because God has found a man that seeks after the heart of God. That means even before this moment, when Samuel visited Jesse's family in Bethlehem, God had already taken note of David. He had already seen this boy and the pastures in the daytime and in the nighttime. It wasn't that David, well, it wasn't what he did in those fields that drew God's attention. It was what was going on in David's heart in those times, in those moments when no one else was looking. His heart was after God. And that's the secret sauce here. God looks to the heart even when we don't realize we're being observed. And what he saw in David's heart captured God's interest and ultimately God's call of purpose and destiny over this boy's life. But man doesn't look there, of course. And nowhere was that more apparent than there at Jesse's house as, uh, as Samuel thought Eliab must be the one. Nope. Then came Jesse's next son. Nope. Not that one either. None of these young men, even if they appeared impressive on the outside, held the heart that God was interested in. So who did? Once all the sons had been observed by Samuel, that, that confirmation in his own spirit, he still didn't feel it yet. He didn't have it. None of these are the one. So he looks over to Jesse. Is this all of them? Seven sons of Jesse stood before Samuel, and none of them were the one. And Jesse must have scratched his head, maybe kind of shrugged, said, well, there's one. There's the youngest. Now, I want to pause right here in this story that's probably familiar to you. I want you to step away from the facts, from the explicit truth we see in Scripture. And I guess I want to jump over to the land of possibilities. Because this is a weird situation here. If the man of God, Samuel, the man whose words never fell to the ground and always held true to the purposes of God, the man who judged Israel for decades, if he came to your house for some mysterious reason, and said he wanted to see all your sons, why in the world would you hold one back? Jesse says David's watching the sheep, but Jesse likely had servants who could have tended the sheep for the duration of Samuel's visit. In fact, later on, when, when David goes off to see his brothers at the battlefront, it says that he left the sheep with the servants. So there were servants present. Why was David not called to the house? Why wasn't he included? Now, here's the theory. This is a theory I personally believe, but I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. So I'm just offering it up as a theory at this point. I think David wasn't included among this roll call of Jesse's sons because neither Jesse nor his sons wanted David there. I think they had a problem with David. I think David represented something else to Jesse and his sons. You ready for this? Here it is. If you scour the Old Testament and the books about David, 
we never find his mother's name mentioned. We find his father mentioned often. We meet his brothers, his sisters, his aunts, uncles, but no mom. She wasn't dead. At one point, we find out later in the story when he's on the run from King Saul, he brings his mom and dad to the king of the Moabites, the family who he was descended from through his great grandmother, Ruth, Ruth. And he left them there with the Moabites for shelter. So his mom's alive, but she's never mentioned my name. And the silence on the, the name of his mom, that actually stuck out to ancient readers who, who didn't read over this and just casually assume it was an oversight or it wasn't important. Ancient Jewish writings, not biblical, but sort of Jewish commentaries type of books and writings, they, they created all sorts of complex theories about this. There was one theory that suggested, this is in, you know, through the centuries, one theory that suggested David's mom committed adultery and he was the product of that affair. Another thought his dad had an affair. And then there's a third theory that believed his dad, Jesse, intended to have an affair with a Canaanite slave, but he actually slept with his wife by accident. A little convoluted, right? A little complex for me. But the point is, there's all these theories out there for an oddly silent part of David's life that most of us don't even notice when we're reading the story today. We just read right over it. When I read the story, though, and I step away from my familiarity and I I just look at it, what's going on here, it's pretty obvious. And again, this is my theory, not a fact, but my theory sees it as pretty obvious that David was a bastard child of Jesse. His father's named, but his mom isn't. When I read the story, I see that he was raised as a son, even in the house of Jesse, but he wasn't a full member of the family like the rest of his brothers were. Even more light is shed on this when we include some tidbits from different Psalms that David wrote. This is Psalm 69, verses 7 to 8, written by David, For I have endured insults because of you, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother's sons. If you've read ahead in the story, then you might remember how irritated his brothers are by his presence when he shows up at the battlefront to fight Goliath. When you read that passage right there, it seems like a bit more than just older brother disliking the upstart little brother. More than sibling rivalry, and maybe it was. There's this one from Psalm 51. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Just kind of makes you go, hmm. (laughs) Again, and not to beat a dead horse, but I'm not saying this is a fact. But the puzzle pieces seem to fit here. It adds another, another layer of texture to the story of David's life. It might also explain, like from, a, I guess, a psychological perspective, some of the serious issues that this guy ends up having with women. And we're going to get to that later in the story. Now, we already looked at the reality of being a Moabite descendant for David. His great-grandma Ruth was a Moabite. That meant David was at least partially a Moabite. And according to Deuteronomy 23, remember we read this verse, that lineage meant he couldn't enter the presence of God. This is the guy who has a heart for the presence of God like no no other king ever did. This is the guy who draws up the blueprints for the the temple of God, right? Deuteronomy 23.3 says, no Ammonite or Moabite may enter the Lord's assembly. None of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, may ever enter the Lord's assembly. For 10 generations, a Moabite descendant could not enter the temple to worship God with the people of God. But if my theory is true, there's even another barrier for David when it comes to entering the temple of God. In the verse just before that one, in Deuteronomy that I just quoted, the one about forbidding a Moabite in the tabernacle of God, this is what it says in verse 2 of chapter 23 in in, uh, Deuteronomy. It says, No one of illegitimate birth may enter the Lord's assembly. None of his descendants, even to the 10th generation, may enter the Lord's assembly. And then the next verse says the same thing, but about a Moabite descendant. Boom. (laughs) Mic drop moment right there. Every once in a while, you come across a little hidden nugget in the Bible like this. It's like God planted these Easter eggs for us to find. Two verses right next to each other. A bastard and a descendant of a Moabite cannot enter the house of God up to the 10th generation. It's almost like these verses were put here right by each other because someone might wonder about these two points someday in the future when it came to the man who would be known 
for his heart for the house of God. Now, if the theory is true, that doesn't cast a shadow on David, in my opinion. It makes the legend, the paradox of his favor before God even more interesting. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And God looked past all these barriers, all these obstacles, the happenstance of David's birth that that birth presented, and God chose David for himself. And that's pretty cool in my book. Of course, the question arises, what was it that God saw in David's heart as he worked in the fields? You know, what was it that drew God's attention? Long before Samuel knew his name, even before Samuel pronounced judgment on Saul in his house, David was shepherding his father's sheep, his father's sheep herds in the fields around Bethlehem. And something about the internal posture, about the way that David worked, caught God's attention. We know the poet king was formed during that time. He'd play his harp to calm the sheep. And the harp playing, he would turn his eyes toward heaven and shape the words and the courses that would one day make up large segments of the book of Psalms. So it would be really easy to get all religious-y right here and imagine David as this light-footed worshiper and that's just all he did. But you got to remember, it didn't stick out to any of his family members. His dad didn't take notice of it. He was an irritant to his brothers. They didn't see him as anything special. They didn't see him the way God saw him. Most of what was shaped within David in those fields was done hidden away at the heart level where men couldn't see, but God did see. It was out there in those fields that David pondered the mysteries of life. What makes a man successful? What's the difference between those who have a good life and those who have a bad life? And he would think about those things, and then he would craft a poem or a song for God in those long hours walking the hills all alone, and one day he would read its words into the book, right? Have someone write down this poem he wrote when he was a teenager, walking alone with his sheep. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Psalm 1. You think about this being formulated as he's just out there in the fields all these years, these formative years, these developmental years, all alone, singing to God with his harp. A heart was formed here. When I was a kid, I mowed yards for neighbors and other folks to make money. I never had a riding lawnmower. It was always pushed. So walking back and forth up and down those lawns in the summer months all alone, me and the noise of my mower, my mind would go to places like this. Now, I'm not saying I'm like a David or anything like that, but I did ponder. I wondered about justice. I wondered about God. I wondered about all sorts of deep mysteries that were kind of exceptional for a 13-year-old kid to be wondering about. No one outside of that moment knew about it. There was no one I could really talk to. Who, who would I tell about these boring ponderings? It would have seemed boring if I said them out loud that I was having as I went back and, up, back and forth in the lawns with my lawnmower. But I really believe God was shaping me in those lawn mowing moments. I think he was also paying attention, just like he did to David during those years. Years later, decades later, I was, uh, I was backpacking. I got big into backpacking for a few years. So I was backpacking through the Ozark Mountains, and I camped out on a mountain, an overlook. It's called Spy Rock. It's a semi-famous trail here in the, the Ozark Mountains. From my campsite that night, the forest opened up into this wide view of the starry night sky above the hills of the Ozarks below. And amid the crackling campfire, as I looked out at that starry sky that night, these words rose up from my heart. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. For you've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. Now, those aren't my words, of course. That's Psalm 8, verses 3 to 5. And it wasn't the exact quote that rose up from my heart in that, that night. But the serenity of the moment, the sight of the stars in the night sky, they all inspired the same sensation that I really think must have provoked David in those shepherd fields thousands of years before. What is man that you're mindful of him? What makes us human? 
Why, what makes us significant? Why do you care about us, God? David was a ponderer. He was a, an inquisitive seeker. He didn't wallow in those Judean fields, just him and the sheep, and have pity parties because his family didn't treat him right or because he felt all alone. His mind turned to God. He sought God. He came to know God there. And that shaped the kind of man he was there. And it shaped the kind of man he was going to become. I really think this is a key part of him becoming the man after God's own heart that Samuel heard about and recognized when he saw him. But he wasn't just the poet king. He's also the warrior king. Later in the book of 1 Samuel, when David goes to fight Goliath, he tells people, trying to explain to them that he's qualified, that while protecting his father's sheep, he killed a lion, he killed a bear at different points. Now we can marvel that he killed these ferocious beasts, but what I'm more interested in is that that shaped his heart when he did that. It shaped him as a man after God's own heart. David wasn't just a poet, he was a warrior. He was a warrior given to protection of the flock that he was charged to oversee. Later, when he comes up against Goliath, he's incensed that his, this uncircumcised Philistine should speak so disrespectfully about God and his people. That, that feeling, uh, that conviction of protection, of guarding those who God put him over, that was shaped in the fields. That was shaped with the sheep, with the lion, and with the bear. God wanted a man after his own heart, a man who would carry the people as a treasure to be protected, a treasure that belonged to God, not to the man, not to be exploited for his own gain. And this was the boy in the fields that no one else noticed, but God did. And that was the boy that God drew Samuel to there in Bethlehem and the house of Jesse. He was the one that God saw even when no one else was looking. So zooming back to our scene there in Bethlehem, the house of Jesse, Samuel and the sons of David, or the sons of Jesse. Jesse brings David in, Samuel meets him, and there it is, like he did with Saul. Samuel anoints him with the anointing oil. Now the the anointing oil was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It covers over David, it changes him from that day forward. He's not perfect, far from it, but he has a calling on him now. Not a commission, it's only a calling. Saul was still more than a decade left on the throne. And there's going to be a lot of ups and downs for David between that moment of that calling before Samuel and his actual commissioning and coronation as king. And these years will be the field of development for David. It's where he's changed from a shepherd to a king. And that progression, the the sequence of events that would move David from shepherd boy to king, at first it seemed to become apparent really quick after the anointing at Bethlehem. When we're reading 1 Samuel, immediately after the anointing, our attention is taken from Bethlehem to the court of King Saul. Remember, this is a different king now. We haven't seen him since the confrontation with Samuel when the Spirit of God left Saul. And in the absence of the Spirit of God on the king, He's degenerated into quite a miserable figure. This is chapter 16, verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul and an evil spirit sent from the Lord began to torment him. That's an odd passage, right? Not sure how that would communicate in today's vernacular, but as we read the story, the rest of the story in 1 Samuel, the behavior of King Saul seems to be the behavior that today we would call like symptoms of manic depression or or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or something. Those are today's words. And maybe neither of those diagnoses are right for what was going on with Saul, but they fit as far as trying to get a handle on what it looked like with today's terminology. We see periods where Saul's peaceful, engaging, honest, kind. Then in the next moment, he flies into a murderous rage, committing insults, committing atrocities, attacks, not only to his perceived enemies, But even to his own family members, he does some wicked stuff to his family members in these years. It's doom and gloom inside the head of Saul. He's not in a good state, and his servants take notice of this, and an odd recommendation is given. There's this shepherd boy. This is what the servants say. They say, there's this shepherd boy in Bethlehem who has a way with songs and with a harp. Why don't we have him in here and see if that helps soothe Saul's soul. So my first question there is, how did they know about David? Samuel didn't know about David. David's own family members 
didn't know too much about him. How did this person at the king's court know about him? And, and for that matter, how did they know about his, his harp, his songs, what he did? Now, a lot of commentators and readers of 1 Samuel, they read the book like a, a political drama playing out between the house of Saul and the house of David. So the guy in the king's court who recommended David to Saul could have been a part of the small faction that supported David's kingship at this early point in the journey. That being said, there's no reason to believe this area of the book has to be in chronological order either. It might be, but it, you know, it might not be. Nowhere is it said, but it could be as Saul got darker and darker in his moods and perceptions, there were whispers among some that not only had Saul turned his his, or not only had Samuel turned his back on Saul, not only had he pronounced God's rejection of Saul, but he had also chosen another. In fact, already anointed another. And amid those whispers, someone at the king's court who had experienced maybe the worst excesses of the king's dark days, they began to plot to create a pathway for this new, newly anointed king to come in to power. That isn't stated in the text. But there's a lot of inference, and it's easy to see how that might have happened. Whatever the case, the anointing of David wasn't common knowledge in Israel. There wasn't a widespread movement for him, not yet. And Saul had no idea about it, in fact. In fact, Saul seemed to be so troubled that he couldn't remember who David was, even though he meets him several times in these early years. David's brought into the king's court. His heart playing was just the right touch. Whenever Saul would start to rage, David's heart playing would soothe him, settle him down. And Saul favored him and made this young shepherd boy part of his court, at least for a season. And there David would have witnessed how the royal house was run. He would have seen its dysfunctions as well as its demands and requirements. Now, it's not clear how long this lasted for David, but it soon proved that this was not the route that God had for David to ascend from anointing as king to coronation. As king. If that was what the plan, in fact, was from some political insiders at Saul's court, it was kind of a dangerous plan. That would surely have gotten David killed, as we'll, we'll see later. But after a season, David, he, he was no longer required at Saul's court. Maybe he was sent away. Maybe the frequencies of the dark moods on Saul, maybe they subsided. But David went back to his father's house, returned to shepherding the sheep. And you can well, you can kind of put yourself in his shoes and what he was thinking then. What about the anointing? What about the call? How is all this supposed to work? David could be ambitious when he needed to be, but it wasn't his core driver. Ambition wasn't. His core driver was the purposes of God. And that's what set him apart at the heart level. So he returns to the fields. He goes back to the sheep. He goes back to his poetry. And he didn't know how it was going to work out. He had an anointing. He had no idea. He could not see how it could possibly work out from there. And then along comes this guy, Goliath. Now, in the last episode, we learned about the Philistines, and we talked about this ongoing war between them and the Israelites. When we come to chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, the war is still raging. The focus of the fighting has shifted to this place known as the Valley of Elah. The Philistines have arrived there, and they're, they're actually stationing their troops on land that belongs to the tribe of Judah. So that means this would have been fairly close to David's home because he was part of the tribe of Judah. Jesse was part of the tribe of Judah. The, the place where the Philistines encamp is called Ephes Demim, which means the edge of blood. <laughs> they have, they've placed their forces on one mountain or hillside and across the valley on the opposite hill, there's the forces of Saul. And the two armies, the Philistines and the Israelites, they've basically worked their way into a deadlock. And this is where we meet Goliath. The story of David and Goliath is probably the most famous story in the Bible. Everyone knows this, knows this one. And that's part of the problem. We know the story and we get so familiar with it and we miss the deeper meanings. When I was young, I traveled to Cuba to visit the underground church there. Now, Cuba was hardcore communist at that time under Fidel Castro. And I'm not saying it's not now. I just, I know it was back then. Christianity was outlawed, hence you had this underground church. Technically or officially, the country was atheist. But the week I was there, there was this big confrontation at the United Nations between Cuba and the United States. And it's a big confrontation in the eyes 
of the Cuban government. I don't know if it was for the U.S. I wasn't there at the time. I was in Cuba. On the front page of the newspaper in Cuba, it said something like, Cuban ambassador confronts American Goliath on the floor of the United Nations. Now, that struck me. Even back then, I was 14, 15 years old. This officially atheist nation was making reference to a story from the Bible. Everyone knows the story, right? Even atheists know this story. I've always wished there was a good movie about the life of David. I haven't found one yet. Most of them are, well, they're either too small a budget, too artsy, or too weird or too perverted. One of the closest I've seen to being good, though, was a sci-fi movie called Kings. This was a little over 10 years ago. It's basically the story of David and Saul set in a different universe. Ian McShane, the, um, the, the Continental Hotel guy from John Wick, he plays King Saul. He does a great job, really steals the movie uh, at playing that, that role. There's some weird stuff in the movie, but overall, it was a good movie. When it came to the story of Goliath, I was curious, how, they, how are they going to portray it? Because this is, it's a sci-fi movie. They're not going like, they're using the story of the Bible, but it's not actually the, the biblical story. Well, in the movie, Goliath is this super tank or weapon that can't be stopped. And the guy, David, figures out a way and becomes a national hero. When I first saw that, I was kind of like, eh, maybe. Didn't seem big enough for me. Didn't seem big enough for the story, right? But when you go, when you really dig into the story of David and Goliath, that picture may have been more fitting, more fitting of an account than I realized at first. David and Goliath is the ultimate tale of underdog versus supervillain. Every culture knows this story. It seems like every cause, everyone has hijacked it for their benefit. The writer Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote books like The Tipping Point. Um, I don't remember what other, <laughs> those are the ones that come to mind right now. But he wrote a book called David and Goliath or on David and Goliath. I can't remember if that's the title or not. He has some really good insights on this. All right. So he, stri- he goes, probably goes too far in my opinion or my perspective, he goes too far in stripping away the spiritual aspect of the story. But I think he does uh, help give some significance to what was going on here by getting to some of the historical facts and realities. Gladwell notes that our image of David as the underdog is a little bit off. The sling David uses wasn't a slingshot for shooting pebbles that we might imagine today. This was a major weapon that hurled stones around the same velocity as a, as a 45 caliber pistol would have done. But what's most significant about Malcolm Gladwell's take on the story is his insights about Goliath. Now, depending on which story or source you look at, Goliath was between six foot nine inches and 10, 10 feet tall. All right. So biblical scholars believe he was a descendant of the Nephilim. This is an ancient race of giants that we read about in the book of Genesis. We know he had brothers who were also giants because we read about them later in the story of David. Gladwell's book on David and Goliath points out that there's several references in the story that suggest Goliath couldn't see well, that he had eyesight issues. So he was a stationary fighter. He had to depend upon close hand-to-hand combat. And so Gladwell pulled up all sorts of medical studies that speculate Goliath had a medical condition that caused his giantism. And it came from a tumor on his pituitary gland that caused an overproduction of human growth hormone. This is all theory, but it fits. So guys like, uh, if you know Andre the Giant, the wrestler, the famous wrestler, he had this same condition of a tumor on his pituitary gland, and it would cause an overflow of this human growth hormone, turn him into a giant. Another big side effect of that condition, however, is vision issues. So keep that in mind as we go through the story here. The armies are gridlocked. They're on these two hills facing one another. And so the Philistines send out their champion, Goliath. This is a pretty common practice in warfare during this time period. The armies would face off. Then champions from each side would fight one another. If you've read this uh, story of the Trojan Wars, then you might recognize this is the same tactic that Hector and Achilles, individual champions from each side facing off in combat while their armies watch. That's what Achilles and Hector do. Well, this is what Goliath and whoever the champion from Israel, that's what they're supposed to do. The problem was, of course, Israel didn't have a champion. Every time Goliath would come out to the valley floor and and holler at the Israelites, he's rubbing it in their face. Saul can't fight him. 
Not sure why, but I don't think it's just because he was afraid. Saul is a great military leader, but not the hand-to-hand combat type of guy. The champion of Israel doesn't have to be the king, but there does have to be someone. But there's no one. It's kind of odd, actually, that no one steps up. Every time Goliath comes out and taunts them, the Bible says the army of Israel was dismayed and afraid. He's killing their morale. And we read in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel that this goes on for 40 days. David, meanwhile, is back home with Jesse, his three oldest brothers with Saul's army. And since the fight is in the land of Judah, Jesse loads David up with food to take to his brothers, as well as to their captains. Jesse's greasing the wheel, making, making sure his sons and the, the men who are in charge of them, of, in charge of sending them into the battle, that they're all taken care of, have full bellies, right? Well, off David goes. He arrives in time to see the two armies lining up for battle formation. They aren't really going to battle. They're just kind of marching around. They're going through the motions. It's all, it's all show at this point. Everything's deadlocked. And in the balance stands Goliath, bellowing, taunting the Israelites. And David hears it all for the first time, and he's kind of shocked. Why is no one fighting this guy? Why is everyone afraid? Why is this crass Philistine being allowed to get away with this kind of talk? He's, he's even more amazed when he hears that King Saul has offered a reward. Whoever will kill Goliath can marry the king's daughter. He'll be given a financial reward. His father's house will be exempt from taxes from this point onward. So maybe it's youthful naivete, but David is just kind of bumfuzzled here. This is not what he expected to find on the front line of Israel's war with the Philistines, a frightened Israelite army, a crass giant deadlock. What's going on here? Why is no one doing anything? And he starts asking questions. Why is no one doing anything here? Why doesn't someone go out and fight this guy? What am I missing? His oldest brother, Eliab, we see him again. He hears David asking these questions and immediately jumps down David's throat. This is chapter 17, verses 28 to 31, the New Living Translation. It says, But when David's older brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You, wanted, you, you just want to see the battle. What have I done now, David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. So like I've already mentioned, that's a weird response <laughs> on the part of Eliab. A little overkill. Sure, he might have been worn out from all the fighting already. Maybe he was ashamed of his own ashamed of his own fear. Maybe he was just frustrated by David suddenly arriving on the scene, having a fresh, unexperienced perspective that didn't match the, the reality of the situation, the gravity of the situation. But it sure seems like overkill to me. Seems like something else is going on there. But say uh, David ends up going to Saul. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. That's literally word for word from the New Living Translation. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Not sure what Saul was thinking when David came in there, but I got to believe somewhere among his thoughts was check out this cocky runt. All right. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persists. He tells him about how he killed a lion. He killed a bear while guarding his dad's sheep. And eventually... Saul gives in. Now, it may be just me, but I don't really think Saul thought David could win this fight. I think he realized he had nothing to lose in this scenario. He's tired of the giant taunting the army and having no one to fight him from among the Israelite ranks. David would probably get killed, but hey, he begged for it. If he got lucky, then there's that. If not, well, Saul hoped something else would come along, right? He tries to outfit David in the king's armor, but that's a no-go. It's too heavy for David. He'll go out without the armor. Him, his his, uh, shepherd's staff, his sling, and five stones that he picks up out of a stream on the way to the giant. Now, before we follow David out to the battlefield, I think it's important to see what's driving him. The human perspectives of David at this point are pretty easy to see. Saul sees a cocky runt. His brothers see an arrogant braggart. But none of these things are who David really is. Remember, God chose David because of what was in the heart. So we got to look beyond those external factors or distractions and see the real David. He's genuinely offended by the things Goliath is saying. For all his faults, 
David is a man deeply devoted, deeply loyal to God. He will be his whole life. It, it genuinely, genuinely makes no sense to him why no one is challenging this giant. He's offended. He's offended on behalf of Israel. He's, he's offended as a young man zealous for the presence of God. So when David walked out to the battlefield that fateful day, he was still un, underdeveloped. He was still immature. He has a lot of life to learn from. But at the core, he was a man of conviction. So while all the rest of the Israelite army and the, the king tolerated the giant's blasphemies and taunts for 40 days, remember, David showed up and immediately said, enough is enough. And as we step into the scene of this fateful con- confrontation, I invite you to push away the Sunday school lessons, the assumptions you already have about the story of David and Goliath. Yeah, we know how it ends, but this is a tense moment. It's actually a pretty dark fight, a dark scene. Goliath has a shield bearer that leads him to the battlefield. Now, talk about a guy <laughs> talk about a guy who had one job and didn't do it right. That dude messed up big on this day. But kidding aside, this is uh this is one of those pieces of the story that suggests Saul had horrible eyesight. He could have carried his own shield. He needed an attendant to escort him onto the battlefield? Well, that was because he couldn't see well, possibly. That doesn't mean he wasn't a fierce fighter. Goliath was terribly fierce. That's why he's the champion. But he was built for close contact. The Bible says he looked upon David with disdain and he said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? That's, that's word for word from the New King James Version. But here's the thing. David wasn't coming with sticks. He was coming with a stick, one stick. Was Goliath seeing double? Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds and the beasts of the field. That's what Goliath says. In fact, that proves to be his final words on earth. But do you hear it? Come to me. The provocations and taunting of the last 40 days were all about getting the champion of Israel, whoever that was, to come to him, come to Goliath. I don't think he could go to them. He's a weapon of war, but that weapon of war depends upon close hand-to-hand combat. If they don't come to him, he can't get to them. And if that's the case, then David was made for this moment. His years in the shepherd's field, learning to use that sling, learning to hit predators like lions and bears that he couldn't get at with close combat, that meant he was the perfect man for this particular fight. Any other champion among the Israelite army would have done exactly what Goliath wanted them to do. They would have gone to him. They would have gotten ready to fight him on his terms. Why would you let the enemy define the battleground? But that was the trap anyone else would have probably fallen into. David hollers back at the giant. Chapter 17, verses 45 to 47. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, that not with the sword and the spear, this is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Then they charge at one another. But David doesn't wait until he gets to Goliath. While he's running, he loads that sling with one of those rocks, lets it rip, and sends that rock like a bullet into the giant. Headshot. Nails him. I think you, you, you probably had to have heard the crack of that rock plunging into this giant's forehead, cracking his cranium, plunging into the frontal lobe of his brain. Goliath jolted, paused, then fell face down to the ground. And on both sides of the armies, of the valley, both armies gasped. No one expected that. Really, at the end of the day, when you boil it down, no one expected that. The only one still moving is David. He keeps charging toward the falling giant. He leaps on top of this this collapsed body. We assume he's dead by this point, but we'll never know for sure. David takes Goliath's own sword out of the sheath, out of the giant's sheath. He hasn't even pulled his sword out yet, and decapitates the once great champion of the Philistines. Then David picks up the massive lopped off head of the giant, holds it in the air, and I got to believe he let loose some kind of vicious war cry at that point. The Bible doesn't say it, but I think there had to be a vicious war cry right there. And that war cry 
was like unlocking the gates of war. The Israelites charged the Philistine army. They ran across the valley, and the Philistines took flight. The deadlock's over, the battle's won, and David, the man of war, has now been revealed to the world. We read in the Bible that David took Goliath's sword for him. And for a while he did anyway. He took the head of the giant to Jerusalem. While he's gathering all of that, he's probably breathing heavy. All around him, soldiers are running as they chase the Philistine army. It's in cold retreat. But from the hillside, amid the chaos, amid the thrill of victory that's consumed the Israelite army camp, from the headquarters tent, the scene is ominously calm. And King Saul on that hillside is watching his army chasing after the Philistines. He's watching that little shepherd boy he thought of as a mere cocky runt a few minutes ago. His lead general, it's his uncle, his name is Abner, he's with him. This is what it says in verses 55 to 56 of chapter 17. Saul asks Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is this young man? I really don't know, Abner declared. Well, find out who he is, the king told him. Saul's sensing something. There's more to this shepherd boy than meets the eye, and Saul begins to wonder if he needs to be concerned about this guy named David. And that's where our story ends today. In the next episode, we're going to look at David the outlaw and his years of development under the hand of God and in flight from the king that he fought for that day against the giant. That's next week on the next episode in our podcast series, The Days of David. 